Hello and welcome to the Spatial Structures Movers and Shakers interview series as we look ahead to the ISS Annual Symposium and Spatial Structures Conference taking place at the University of Surrey in August 2021. My name is Mark Richardson and today I'm joined by Katja Burnett, who is an architect at operating manufacturer of textile membranes, Mela Technologies. Katja is founding member and chairman of the International Industry Association the Architectural Membrane Association and a member of the Institute for Membrane and Shell Technology. Katya, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hello, Mark. No problem at all. It's a, a real pleasure to have you on the Movers and Shakers interview series, Katya. Um, as ever, we start by asking our guests about the period of lockdown. How has that been for you in Germany? Well, it's, it's been a year uh, almost uh, already, uh, which is amazing because time's running so quickly. And um, well, the school uh, of our kids uh, stopped last year mid-March and that was the time when I started working in, from home, which is, um, well, it's good on the one hand because um, the work is much more conceptual and uh, sometimes quieter, which is good. Um, but obviously uh, at some other point, it's just like, you know, I miss my colleagues, I miss yeah. production and I miss the proximity to, to the weaving looms, to the sound of the production and to the, to the actual material. Because uh, what I have here is just what, you know, anybody can have in the world, like samples of all my brains, but it's so, so much different to have the real, you know, like 2000 meters, uh, running meters, of a type five or type four membrane. And this is something like completely different to a, an A4 sample, yeah. which, you, which you usually got. So um, this is something uh, which I miss, but um, it's, quite, it's quite good as well, because we are lucky, we, we are six of us. So uh, we are not, none of us getting uh, lonely. And um, we got a quite interesting co-working space, not only with my husband, but uh, with my kids as well. So at times we meet at the coffee or tea break, whatever, and uh, exchange ideas. And sometimes it's, it's quite fruitful, this atmosphere. It's much, you know, it's, it's all that much different from what I usually do in the office. So, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing my colleagues again, but this is fine here as well. And we're looking forward to the spring and, well, uh, it's all good, getting better soon, I hope. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Katia. And, and good to see some positives in a um, very challenging sort of situation. Um, now, as we mentioned, you work for textile membranes manufacturer Miller Technologies. Um, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about this organisation. Well, it's, it's basically a company. Uh, it's a quite old company. Um, it was founded in 1837 which is quite long ago already. So uh, it was a weaving company in the middle of Germany, Fulda, uh, founded by Valentin Mela. And uh, for the 100th birthday present, uh, they, so to say, um, gave a wonderful um, brand, which is Valmex. That's the brand for the architectural fabrics. And we're still using those fabrics uh, to date. Um, of course, at the beginning, it was not like, you know, the, the coded, uh, membranes that we use now for textile architecture at the beginning it was more like tablecloth or um, coated fabrics for rain raincoats these sorts of things but very soon it developed further and the looms went bigger and wider so that um, I think starting in the 1950s already uh, we had these vinyl coated PVC uh, PVC coated uh, polyester fabrics which were then used very early uh, by uh, Freyotte as well for some of these early projects like, um, like the one in Bad Hersfeld, it's kind of a convertible roof. Uh, and then there was some other project in, uh, for, for a company in Germany, Wilkan, uh, very similar to the uh, Institute in Stuttgart. So um, very early there was a cooperation between the team of Rayoto himself and uh, Mela Technologies or Mela as the company was then called. And uh, it was uh, a pioneering time of the, uh, of the, uh, of the age of a new age of tensile architecture. And of course, I was not part of that time <laughs> in the 1950s. Um, I joined Leila just a bit later. But uh, I really think uh, that made us uh, some sort of experts in tensile architecture. And, and we still try to, 
to do these beautiful projects and I'm obviously working in, in the most wonderful department of Mela Technologies for Tensile Architecture. Altogether, we are doing uh, more than 50 million square meters of coated fabrics, which are, of course, not all these beautiful tensile architecture projects. It's mostly, well, honestly, it's mostly truck uh, and ten fabrics and all these sorts of things. But, um, well, for me, it's always uh, the best bit uh, to have these uh, tensile architecture projects. And of course, the project business is something completely different from what we have my colleagues have when selling a truck tablet, for example, it's obvious. So, um, but my job is uh, very, very close to the designers, very close to the ones uh, actually using our fabrics. And uh, I, I, I always interlink uh, the users, uh, so to say the market with our research and development team, the people who actually do and develop the fabrics and the people who 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 stand, are standing at the looms? Who are standing at the coding machines? And at the end, you know, like in 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 the uh, in the most exciting projects, we we got uh, a product at the end which is just uh, amazingly uh, suitable for this specific project. Um, this is something which happens in tensile architecture, but the daily business, especially of my colleagues, uh, is something completely different. And well, we've been uh, joining another company, another uh, textile company last year, the Freudenberg company, which, which is a big uh, German holding uh, with a very long textile history too. So um, I haven't met any of these Freudenberg people in person uh, because of the lockdown all this year, but uh, I'm really happy about being part of this Freudenberg company because uh, uh, their, their, their slogan is innovating together. And this is what I try to push in my daily work, uh, innovating and, and you know, producing new uh, materials which are suitable for the products, uh, projects of today. And um, well, I, I, I really, I, I'm an enthusiast about tensile architecture and uh, the people who know me know that I'm always like exploding because of uh, all this admiration of the, old uh, textile architecture project and of the new ones. And I'm really happy to work in this uh, company and especially in this area uh, of tensile architecture. Amazing, thanks Katia. It sounds like a very vibrant working atmosphere and it sounds like there's a lot of exciting things going on. Um, perhaps to that, could you tell us about a particularly memorable project you have worked on at Miller? Well, there is a project um, which is almost as old as, as me. Um, it, it doesn't live in the original state uh, anymore, like I am. <laughs> but uh, it was um, it's a grandstand canopy in Elster. It's a very small town in Germany, and um, it, it was installed in '78. So that was when I was in the kindergarten, uh, and then it lasted very, very long. So it was a type five membrane. It was only taken down in 2015 in order to be replaced uh, by exactly the same material, a type five membrane uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this new manufacturing was done by Koch membrane, but uh, they used the same fittings, the same engineering, the same fabric as the original planners did in the 70s. And I think that's, uh, well, for us, this is a special project because the monitoring was quite uh, well well, uh, well done. Uh, starting from, right from the start was, uh, there was um, uh, the Aachen University uh, supervising the, uh, the actual production uh, of this uh, type 5 membrane. And then uh, there was a, uh, monitoring uh, every other year, uh, which proved that the tensile stresses in the membrane were actually quite good till the end. And it was not torn down because it was in danger of falling down or anybody was in harm of like, uh, you know, uh, no people had to be afraid of having a tensile fabric falling on their, uh, on their heads. It was just the color, which was of course not, not that beautiful anymore as it was in the 1970s. So they, they took this type five membrane down and uh, we had a quite good uh, monitoring about the weather in the meantime, about the tensile stresses and all these parameters. And um, we, we, we were quite amazed ourselves uh, finding out in, the, in, in 2015 that the, the loss of tensile strength was actually not, not really big and considering the safety factors that we usually have in tensile architecture, um, 
structures, it was quite good. And you know, this, this probably doesn't only happen to our fabrics. It, it's it's just to prove to everybody that these fabrics, even if they are from the 1970s, are, are meant to last like forever. You know, and and uh, obviously today we got much more op much more options to to safeguard the fabric. So um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that projects of today will even last longer than uh, 37 years. So um, there's a bright future to come and um, I'm looking forward to more of these sorts of projects. Sounds great. Yeah, and amazing to hear about the durability and longevity of the uh, of the project you described there. Thanks, Katia. So we'll now move on to the middle section of our interview, which um, is entitled Your Space, Your Structure. So at this point, I hand over to Katia, who will be presenting for um, a period of time on a spatial structures topic of personal interest to her. So over to you, Katia. Thank you very much. And although this section is called um, My Structure, My Space, I, I chose to, to make it more an appeal, to, to make it more in a, pe a petition uh, to everybody um, watching this, everybody involved in tensile architecture and everybody not yet involved in tensile architecture. So um, I, I think uh, it is time to rethink about fault finding, um, not the way we were thinking about it all the time, all the last 50 years, so to say. I think we need to rethink about this. And um, this is a mission I've been following for the last more than 20 years. Um, I am in tensile architecture. Uh, I started uh, with GMP Archi Architects in 1999 with my first textile project, the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. And at first I thought it was the mission of surrendering the, the right angle and uh, like um, telling everybody how beautiful these saddle shapes can be. But in the meantime, I think it's much more and, and my mission, so to say, uh, widened to, to some other aspects. And, and uh, all I try to do is um, convey my enthusiasm about tensile architecture. Uh, in, in my case, it's actually textile architecture. So I'm always having fabrics uh, in, in the structures. So it's textile architecture. I'm standing here on the roof of the Commerzbank Arena in Frankfurt. That's the World Cup Arena um, for the FIFA World Cup in 2006 in Germany. And that was, so to say, my roof, uh, which I was doing when I was still with GMP Architects. After after the roof in Olympic Stadium in Berlin, I did this one. And I think it's just amazing how you can stand on a fabric which is just a millimeter thick and then like walk on it like you walk on, on clouds. And I, I just love this feeling. And, and um, what I try along the fact that, you know, I try to con convince architects to, to, to surrender the right angle, to, to have, uh, to, to be confident enough to stand on these, sorts of membrane to think that they last a very, very long time. And um, what I think is exciting as well in our field of uh, work is that we are very, very close to the joint of architecture and structural engineering. It's probably the closest you can get. And um, yeah, that's that's what I love about the this particular job. And um, well, uh, it's not only the enthusiasm, it's about training our brains about um, making these two opposing sides work together. Uh, the one is the creative side, which is probably, for me as an architect, is probably a bit, well, I'm, I'm more on this colorful sort of thing. Uh, various, um, the structural engineers, and um, many of the people who've been uh, in these interviews before me are probably more on this on this formula side, which I absolutely admire because you know uh, you will not find any formula except for these ones in this little picture in in this presentation because I, I'm not you know I'm not that close to these formulas. I, I, I probably I'm a bit closer to the uh, creative side um, of the job. So. Um, but I think it is it is really something um, something which is it's a wonderful job to make these opposing sides cooperate. And uh, if you succeed on your own brain scope, then the next level is to cooperate with a structural engineer. And uh, we are actually already on this next level uh, because we already learned how to cooperate in textile architecture. We already have the daily life of talking to structural in engineers who uh, do some specifications for specific projects, which are then, um, well, hopefully, 
<clears throat> replied for by the um, coating industries or um, well or some 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 other um, levels we we are uh, striving for but still uh, we are already on a very very high level i'd say when it comes to the cooperation not only between the two sides of the brain but as well between the cooperation uh, between architects and uh, structural engineers but um, it's only uh, thinking outside the box or thinking uh, or surrendering the right angle um, we've got some beautiful tools already and uh, with the help of algorithms um, in this form finding process um, uh, we it gets much easier to to design these sorts of um, projects and only to design them uh, it's much easier as well to uh, to get them built you know that's that's most important for the architect because it, it doesn't really make sense to to just design something um, it, you want to see it in 3d and um, this is always the best bit, I'd say, and, and form finding tools, at least the computational modeling that we, that we, uh, not we, not I, but many others in the business develop uh, within the last 50 years, uh, make it much easier. And um, we understand the forces much better, uh, which are in our structures, at least the forces which are in the structures at the time of installation. And um, I think, well, and that's what what I what I want to appeal for. What, why I call this little presentation uh, a petition more than a, pre a presentation, uh, because I think um, that this this way of uh, form finding doesn't really help us, for example, to uh, to think about our global footprint or to 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 invent or produce an insulin uh, insulated translucent structure, which is um, prevailing over condensate. So we got there are so many um, challenges in textile architecture which can't be answered by a mere algorithm, which can't answer can't be answered by the uh, computational form finding. The, we we got to use our um, brains um, much more, I think, than we do today, and uh, to uh, to 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 use our intuition uh, as well. So um, well, and it, it's probably this this rethinking of form finding or this finding new um, materials which correspond better to our um, ecological footprint or which um, make us, um, well, uh, makes, ma makes it possible to have insulated roofs, um, uh, to have these products is probably, it's probably the, the supplier's job, you would think. And, and, and partly you are absolutely right. Uh, and that's why, there have been, especially in the past, I have to say, there have been a couple of push factors uh, coming from the industry side and enabling uh, projects like these ones I've been talking um, about before. This is uh, in the middle bubble, so to say, it's the Vilkamp project from Frauto, and on the right hand side, the Hersfeld convertible roof, which is a type three um, membrane. And I have to admit, it's a risk that I think they, they got the second or third replacement already um, because uh, being convertible uh, is a hard job for, for, a, um, for a membrane. And that's why they, they had to replace this a couple of time, times, but it is a project which derived from the 1960s. And that's, uh, you know, like from, from uh, the coders side of, uh, Point of view is quite good actually to have this sort of uh, fabric lasting uh, for such a long time um, being uh, like open and closed um, all the season uh, when the theater is playing underneath so there is a push factor from the industry side um, providing materials which enable designers like Frialto and his team to 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 have these long lasting Projects. I think the Vilkan project is actually still the, the same cover uh, from the original uh, uh, project. Well, and of course, uh, that is, it is the material supplier's job um, to, to enhance the properties. And there have been a couple of enhancements in the, in the last couple of years. I talked about the, uh, the durability already. I, talked, I, I didn't talk about cleanability, but of course this is very closely linked because uh, the, the, be the better the, the fabric is cleanable, the longer it'll last. And of course, uh, the whole industry, not only us, uh, have been talking about recyclability. 
um, of our material. And um, but this topic is is actually not one of my favorites because I think uh, we still we still didn't reach the um, uh, the best solution in this case because uh, honestly only only very very few uh, materials are actually recycled and um, I think you know it, it's quite difficult to make customers pay for a recycling process in such a low budget project uh, product really and um, as long as uh, legislation doesn't help us to to make the customers actually pay for the recycling process it, it will not be recycled so uh, only very very rarely we get uh, used membranes back and um, and these are then recycled and um, well I think there is much space to improve on this uh, side of the production chain. So Second Life uh, is not something that we talked about uh, properly till now. And although some of our truck tablets are, are beautifully recycled in, in, in bags, like in these beautiful Freitag bags, but you, you can't build as many bags as you have in these textile architecture projects. So we really need to do more on this side. Well, and, and you're gonna push, you know, it's the designers, it's the structural engineers, who have to make us invent something um, so that I can go to my colleagues from uh, R&D and tell them, look, you know, there is this just wonderful project and we'd really uh, be lucky to be part of this beautiful project. So we need to have this in this project. It needs to be a type three, which has a translucency of a type one and the, the color of, uh, I don't know, pink, uh, whatever you like. So um, this is something uh, that we try to, to look for if somebody uh, pulls us and say, look, uh, we, we need this and that for uh, our project. But this is still, this still very rarely helps us to think about our global footprint and computer added form finding will not solve this project, uh, this pro problem either. So um, there have to be ways of rethinking of um, having a new way of uh, starting these sorts of projects from the start. And, and I, I, as I said before, I think intuition is something um, which is really important. And I, I don't want to, to be seen as like retro, uh, like uh, loving the old times, which didn't have any computers. No, no, no. Uh, I, I just think that uh, we are a bit uh, too far away from this physical modeling. And um, I think it is very, very important, especially in our, uh, in the way we design that we uh, come back to these beautiful ways of finding the form uh, with a physical model, not with a computer. And um, we, we have to still enhance our cooperation between the architects and the engineers, um, because I think there's uh, still more space to improve. And um, well, it's absolutely clear that uh, Mela's chemists will not be able to, to, to find the most wonderful material on their own. Neither will be the only ones who can answer the question if we can replace PVC in the future. So, um, or, or to, to, to answer the question, how much recycled material we can have in a structure, uh, in a membrane really. And uh, as I said before, it's legislation which can help this. You know, if we are forced to use upcycled material in our membranes, and if we only offer a recycled TF400 and not any more than normal TF400, that's the mesh membrane for facades, um, then I think everybody is still, you know, everybody will buy these recycled products. But as long as they got the, the chance of paying less, for not recycling, for not using any upcycled materials, I think it, it's just fair enough to say, look, uh, the roof or the cover always comes at, at the end of a project. So we got to understand that people want to save money or need to save money. So they won't bother about recycling or using upcycled material. And uh, that's what we got to change. And uh, we can only change this together. It's something that only functions in corporations. And uh, that probably only functions if uh, the designers well got an idea of uh, what is happening at Mela. And this is really something that is, that is um, a pity in this lockdown, 
because we are not anymore able to invite people come to see our weaving looms and come to see our coating machines because I think that is very something really really important to be close to the not only for myself it is very important to be close to the production side it's something which is as well important for the designers and this is why I incorporated a little video it's just 10 seconds which comes on the uh, on the next slide and I'm really sorry because you can't you can't hear the sound because you've got to imagine that this is just the most the loudest sound you can imagine and having a production site with 50 of these rooms is just amazing beautiful you know although it's loud it's just it's just wonderful because it's so close to the actual um well the actual production really and it, it i know it's very far away from these formulas but i i'm really convinced that sometimes you need to come back to the roots look at a weaving loom and see what's happening there you know and that enables you to fly high and, and design the most beautiful uh, structures and then you know the structural engineer uh, can can like calculate that it works and, and you know at the end it's a beautiful corporation product which is seen uh, like the Olympic Stadium in Munich for example but um, well uh, there uh, Every now and then you need your intuition, you need to come back, uh, see a weaving loom in order to be able to fly high and uh, make these beautiful projects. Well, and uh, that's what I uh, wanted to stress once more, it's, it's rethinking form finding and, and we've got to understand this in a much broader sense. We, we, we've got to um, probably not only cooperate between architects and civil engineers, uh, or structural engineers, um, there, there might be other people who can help us uh, or help the project in order to be more beautiful, to be more sustainable. And uh, this is something which is incorporated in the, uh, in the idea of the new European Bauhaus. Um, I put European in, 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 um, in these brackets because I absolutely appreciate that IASS is not a European community it's uh, wonderful that it's an international lot of people and um, I, I just took this uh, as an example because I, I think that this um, new European powers which derives from this green deal uh, which uh, was founded last year I think um, uh, is a very important approach a very good approach uh, to uh, to a new way of uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, it's basically, you know, this is a slogan which I don't particularly like, uh, beautiful, sustainable, together. What it basically means that it's uh, connecting the people who got the solutions and empower them to, to put them into reality. And um, this is like in the original Bauhaus, more, founded more than 100 years ago. This is um, a match of sustainability and beauty and handiness and so many more. Uh, properties, but the culmination is basically uh, uh, the, the beauty on the one hand and the uh, sustainability or utility on the other. And there are, at least from the Coders and Weaver side, a couple of examples um, like, um, well, I have to talk about this bubble first because this is an example of Frauto. I think uh, this just shows how beautifully uh, he already knew what uh, interdisciplinarity means. You know, you don't only have these beautiful roofs, these structures, but you have to think about uh, humans as well, because it's all about humans that we're building for, and it's, it's about nature that uh, we we build, and it's about uh, the the interchange between this human being on the one hand side and nature on the other, and in between is the architecture, the structure which we as creative people put into uh, this dialogue. So uh, I think here we got already a just wonderful example. I particularly like this, uh, I think it's just a notebook scribbling, um, which was done in the 1980s, obviously. And it shows uh, in one bubble what I would like to express uh, in my little appeal here. So um, there are a couple of examples which already show um, cooperation, not only between architects and structural engineers, but between architects, 
optical expertise, mecha mechanical engineering, and uh, analytical chemistry. Uh, this is uh, the Urban Healing Skin Project, which was done by um, the Aachen University. Jan Zerode is the, the, uh, the one who's, who's initiated this project with an NOx filtering textile facades. And we are very happy to be part of this project because I think it's just a beautiful way of putting uh, textile fabrics, textile facades into a very, very good use. You know, they're beautiful anyway, but having an NOx full, uh, filter involved makes them just much more beautiful and much more useful at the same time. And I just wish there were more of these textile facades all over the world and in these cities which nowadays tend to be more metal and glass than anything else. Well, and I've talked about the RPET fabrics uh, already uh, that's uh, made of 100% uh, upcycled PET bottles. Uh, I said that we're part of Freudenberg and Freudenberg, for example, is one of the biggest users of uh, recycled PET. That's what RPET is for. And um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to not having only one article uh, made of this upcycled PET bottles, but uh, there could be many, many more if there were just the people uh, applying it and, and using this in their uh, projects. And of course, uh, we are in a good way um, with smart textiles, not only us, uh, the whole uh, business really, uh, very smart people doing smart projects, smart products, uh, for example, functionalizing the fabric, um, involving energy harvesting and um, all these sorts of things. Light is probably the, the least uh, complicated bit which we can integrate in our fabric, but there are many, many more opportunities to um, functionalize the fabric. Well, and um, as we already know that um, form follows force and we can optimize our um, use of material to, to a minimum, um, we are quite well ahead, really, um, because uh, we are used to, it's, you know, not only we as architects, but you as structural engineers, or everybody involved with uh, shells and spaces like uh, the IISS community, uh, we are quite well ahead when it comes to cooperating or when it comes to looking beyond our own nose. And I think uh, we just need to keep on cooperating. We just need to... Uh, keep on talking to another and you just need to pull us as a as a as a coating and weaving company and, and tell us look you know I need this specific project I need this specific material and you got to do it uh, within a year in a month or, or three months or so and then we would invite you and say look at these like massive weaving machines we can't do this in a month we just have to try and look for the longevity and look for uh, a lot of parameters, but then, you know, uh, the architects who has once seen huge machines in our production site, uh, he or she will certainly understand much better um, that, that it's not that difficult or that, that easy in this case uh, to develop something on a very short hand basis. So it's very important to uh, remember that the development of a new product is uh, something which takes some time, but of course we love to be pushed by these uh, innovative things, by these innovative projects. And um, altogether, um, the built environment is already something like a symphony of expertise. Uh, there are so many different things involved, not only structural engineering, not only architecture, uh, many, many more things. And I think that's why I call it rethinking form finding. I think we, we still have to get on the next level, not only working with our Excel sheets or not exclusively thinking in algorithm when it comes to finding the right form or finding the, the forces or, or all these sorts of things. So there is still uh, some, some other options. And I do hope that it's not really ending up in some sort of escapism. Um, so the textile architecture helping the, the, the other architects uh, to, to escape from the, the, the many questions which the environment uh, poses and escape from the many things which um, endanger our architecture. Um, this is a project, you know, I always love to include this um, this slide into or this sort of picture into my presentations because um, 
this is uh, in the town where I come from. It's Mies van der Rohe um, um, Villa um, from the 1920s. And it was for one exhibition, it was covered in a pneumatic, uh, you know, uh, in a tent, so to say. And I really, and it was a, uh, an artist's uh, um, work, uh, Rukako, uh, House Rukako. And uh, they wanted to show that, you know, there is not always, there doesn't always need to be a connection between the environment and uh, the, the people living in the architecture, living in the houses. It's sometimes probably better to escape and to, to have your own environment for yourself. But I think, and that's what I try to appeal for, um, it, it, it's not the, the last solution. It, it, it's, it's probably, uh, it, it's obviously not the best solution either. It, it's just a very, very important that we keep on cooperating and that we keep on um, rethinking about our form finding, that we keep on looking beyond our own nose. And um, this is, Simply, simply done among us. This is, will this will hopefully develop in in Guildford this summer uh, if we all meet again uh, in person. Um, it hopefully even works on a digital level now, now that we are also practiced. But um, yeah, we we still all of us have continuously to leave our comfort zones, and I'm really looking forward to doing this together with all of you, uh, not only in Guildford uh, for the IRSS symposium but in the future with the next textile projects. Thank you very much, that was it. Katia, thank you very much for your presentation there, uh, covering among other things, membrane structures and the idea of rethinking form finding. Very interesting and very insightful presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're now gonna move to the final section of our interview, which looks towards the future of spatial structures. And indeed, the um, 2021 conference, where the key theme of the conference is inspiring the next generation. What advice would you offer, Katia, to aspiring engineers and architects looking to enter the field of spatial structures? Well, uh, I'd advise them to visit us, uh, to visit a weaving um, production site and, and see the weaving looms and hear, particularly hear them and then see these huge coding machines, um, you know, that, that really helps um, architects and engineers to get a closer grasp of, of what it actually means, not only uh, applying uh, fabrics for tensile structures, but as well to produce them. And I think uh, it, it's much more, more important to have not only the A4 sample uh, to look at it and feel it, you know, feeling is so, uh, is so important, but still looking at the weaving machine and seeing how it works is something definitely important. Agreed, thank you. And this is an invitation, so to say, you know, everybody interesting, uh, uh, interested in seeing these sorts of things uh, can contact me and, and come to Mila and see these. Uh, Sounds things. brilliant. Uh, yeah, excellent. I hope uh, I hope our viewers take you up on that in the future. Um, and we've obviously already sort of alluded to this, but what do you think are the most pressing challenges in the field of spatial structures and um, with respect to some of the current global challenges? Yeah, I, I, I told before that I, I think that we uh, have to, to look at this environmental aspect. Uh, and and uh, that's why I, I called it rethinking about form finding because it's not only about uh, architecture on the one hand, structural engineering on the one hand, uh, on the other hand, and this beautiful uh, forms in between. It's about our uh, footprint. It's about using more um, recycled materials probably changing legis legislation so everybody is forced to use these uh, and forced to recycle at the end. So uh, it, it doesn't make sense to only talk about recycling. Uh, we on the quotas uh, and weavers um, side, we got to do much more in this direction. And hopefully the, the community uh, of tensile architecture uh, people will help us to, to, to go in this direction. Thank you very much, Katia, and thank you indeed for joining us on the Movers and Shakers interview series. Um, it was fantastic to speak to you today and get an insight into your ongoing work. Um, for those watching our YouTube uh, interview series, um, a reminder that registration for the 2021 conference is now open. Do head to the 2021 conference for more information. The website has all of the facts there. And um, a reminder to those watching our series, please do like, share and comment on our interviews. We welcome all of your ideas and feedback. Uh, but now, for now, Katia, thank you once again for joining us today. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity to catch up with you again as we move closer 
to the 20, 2021 conference. But uh, yeah, for now, yeah. <laughs> thank you very uh, much for having me. No thank problem you. at all. Uh, see you very soon. Bye for now. Bye, Mark. Thank you.